How should we meet our tests? Truth is one and eternal. Realize oneness with it in your deathless self within. The following commentary is based on the teachings of Paramahansa Yogananda. Last week, we considered Satan's temptation of Jesus in the wilderness after his baptism by John. We discussed the question, does Satan exist? All of us experience temptation of one kind or another in our lives. Some of us frequently, others only occasionally. Whether temptation comes to us from our own subconscious or from outside ourselves is secondary to the fact that it does come and that we must deal with it. More important then is the question, how to deal with it? In fact, how to deal with tests of any kind? Martin Luther flung an ink pot at the devil who had appeared to test him. A dark stain on the wall of Luther's cell is pointed out to tourists in support of the story. Unfortunately, our trials are not often so summarily dismissed. As a fellow monk once said to Swami Kriyananda, speaking of Satan, if only I could get my hands on him. Jesus, during his temptations in the wilderness, overcame them and thereby set an example for all time by clinging the more determinately to God. As Paramahansa Yogananda used to say, darkness cannot be driven out of a room with a stick. Once you turn on the light, however, the darkness will vanish as though it had never been. Jesus manifested this principle. The Bible tells us therefore that at last the devil leaveth him, and behold, angels came and ministered unto him. In the Bhagavad Gita, the point is clarified further by the added explanation that there are three qualities in human nature, sattvic, or spiritually elevating, rajasic, or ego-activating, and tamasic, or spiritually darkening. It is this triune aspect of human nature that the third chapter refers to with these words. As fire is hidden by smoke, as a mirror is dulled by rust, and as an embryo is enclosed in the womb, so is the indwelling self enveloped by desire. Yogananda explained that each of these examples describes one of the qualities or gunas, sattva guna, that which elevates our consciousness, can be freed of any identity with ego by a little puff of meditation and right affirmation. Rajoguna, which embroils the ego in restless activity, can be worked off with a little more and a little longer effort. Tamoguna, embracing as it does such mental states as laziness and stupidity, can only be outgrown in time, since it inhibits even the desire for self-improvement. The example Jesus gave us was intended more for those in whom sattva guna is predominant. But if you yourself find elements in your consciousness that resist even the effort to cling to God and prayer and meditation, don't despair. Patience, as it has been well said, is the fastest path to God. As long as your efforts take you steadfastly, in the right direction, you will come out right in time. Remember Yogananda's words, a saint is a sinner who never gave up. If, however, your nature impels you even against your will 
to move in the wrong direction toward egoic desires and away from God, strive at least to detach yourself mentally from your wrong actions, which are induced by habit. The time will come when their own stored up energy will tire and diminish. At this time, if you have not contributed to that energy by your consenting will, you will find it possible at last to redirect your energies more constructively. Thus, through Holy Scripture, God has spoken to mankind. to do this Sunday service together with a legendary man from antique methodology, Indian methodology, Yudhisthira, and I asked him if it was all right, and he said, it depends how you tell my life, so I have to do my best. Yudhisthira was the greatest, is the greatest of the Pandava brothers who in the Mahabharata represent the spiritual qualities within each one of us, the ones that help us grow, thoughts, attitudes, inspiration, and so on. And they are in total six brothers, two twins, no, five brothers, because the sixth one, Pandu. Yudhisthira, so is a son of Pandu, but is also a son a son of Panda, the god of death, who is also the god of Dharma. Only in India they can invent these uh, stories. In India it's never this or that. No, it's this and also this and also that. It's beautiful. It helps all of us to think a little bit like that, don't you think? Less black and white. So anyway, he is son of Pandu and also son of Yama, the king, the uh, uh, god of death. And he became famous for an answer that he gave where he presents himself maybe more than the son of Yama, god of death, and the son of Pandu because he, in order to save his brothers who are apparently on the floor they seem dead next to an uh, enchanted lake, and he, in order to save them, needs to answer some uh, magic questions, or otherwise he will lose his brothers forever. And one of his answers became very famous. He was asked, what is the greatest beauty of the world, the greatest wonder of the world? And he says, what I wonder more about is that Men know that they are mortal, but they don't stop to desire to be immortal, and they live as if they were immortal. Isn't that strong? You need to be a son of Yama to say something like that. But what he indicates us really with this answer is to remember that we need to die. The human body will die, needs to die. We have counted days, karmically counted. And so to make an effort, uh, maybe not to wait until we are old, to make an effort to choose those attitudes and directions that help us to expand and to go beyond the body. Because once we have gone beyond the body and the ego, then there is no mortality anymore. The body dies, but we don't. So, Yudhisthira, at the end of the Mahabharata, needs to uh, confront some very severe tests. Think about that the battle of Kurukshetra uh, is, has passed and the Pandavas are governing. Time passes, Krishna leaves his body, and when the Pandavas know that also Krishna has gone, they too leave the 
government into the hands of spiritually competent people and wander about in pilgrimage and they go towards the Himalaya for their last uh, call and during the last path and during that very high hiking Yudhisthira loses one brother after the other first the twins Nakula and Sahadev and then uh, the brother Arjuna and then Bhima and very valuable all his brothers and he is son of Yama who is also Dharma so he refuses to give up in his pain he continues to contemplate the blue sky which we have sung about and he continues to go up on the mountain in his body and in the sky they are impressed by his determination and Indra the king of the sun the king uh, of the gods uh, comes down towards him. Shantidev is helping me out here because he is an expert in Indian methodolo um, um, methodology. So he comes towards uh, him in his body and says, here, come. Uh, come on my chariot and I will help you go towards the sky. But uh, And Yudhisthira had had received some company on his hiking by a dog. This is important to remember. This dog he got a little attached to. So Yudhisthira, when he uh, gets onto the chariot, also this dog wants to get on the chariot. And Indra says, no, 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 that dog doesn't come. And Yudhisthira says, why are dogs not welcome in paradise? They're not even welcome at another village. <laughs> but the, the, there's a reason for it. So Yudhisthira says, so if the dog can come, then I won't come. Thank you. See you. And so he overcomes a great test because the dog represented, he was incarnated dharma. And what does this tell us? It tells us that when everyone has left us, the friends have betrayed us, our dear ones have died, then we discover that Dharma is always and has always been our own, own companion in life. Until we are not in Dharma, we have an emptiness in our heart and the beautifulest uh, wedding, the, the greatest friends, the spiritual community, illuminated community, we can have those. But if we don't have Dharma with us, then this emptiness in our hearts will leave us very, very lonely. So Yudhisthira had, has shown his faith in Dharma and Dharma remained with him. That's how he could deal with the loss of his beloved brothers too because he always was true to Dharma. So when this dog has done his job then he vanishes uh, like, uh, like it often happens in these stories. And so Indra says, okay, great, you have overcome a big test. So now come on the chariot and they go to paradise, the most beautiful place that you can only imagine of golden light and fountains and beautiful skies and uh, flowers and so many illuminated people amongst whose Duryodhana, the He's the enemy of the Pandavas, the one who has started the war of Kurukshetra, the one who forced the Pandavas to kill so many cousins and family. And Duryodhana is there, happy and content on a beautiful throne in paradise and being a good 
man. And so Yudhisthira looks at him and says, that is impossible. This man, incarnation of the uh, bad, all bad things, he caused so much suffering. I need to see him here in Svarga, in paradise, on the throne, still governing. How is this even possible? So the spiritual guides appear to Yudhisthira and they scold him a little bit and they say, if you are at the point to enter paradise, you should have left behind you all forms of resentment. You should be free of the even a true resentment because the resentments just justify themselves and you should not have permitted these sentiments in your heart. You are right. Duryodhana did bad things and now he's here, but you should not have these sentiments in your heart. So Yudhisthira reflects on it, tries to make this teaching his own, and then he asks, where are my brothers? Where are Nakula, Sahadev, Bhima, Arjuna? I don't see them here. And the spiritual guides look around and say, also, we don't see them. And so Yudhisthira says, so here in paradise, I don't want to be here. Thank you. I want to be where my brothers are, my beloved brothers with whom I defended the flag of Dharma. Okay. They say and say, I'll bring you out of Swarga out of paradise and they come into a place like hell, a terrible smell and worms and mice and rats and dead bodies around, but especially this terrible smell. So Yudhisthira says, where are they? Where are we here? Where are, where are my brothers? And then he hears a voice, I'm Arjuna, I'm Sadif, I am Bhima, I'm Nakola, we are here, we are here, please stay with us, don't abandon us. And Yudhisthira asks again, how is it possible that my brothers with whom I kept up the flag of Dharma, defended Dharma, that they are in this horrible place? And the spiritual guides cannot answer him. And so he says, my trip is over here. I will stay with my brothers. At that point, when he takes this decision, slowly the place where they are transforms into the true Svarga, the true paradise. And Yudhisthira has overcome the third test, big test. Yudhisthira represents in the anatomy of yoga, the fifth chakra, Vishuddha chakra, where the quality, the spiritual quality of karma resides, let's say from the heart upward, spiritually becomes more natural to live. In the first chakras we work with our ego, we discipline our ego to take directions, spiritual directions flowing upward. Once we are in Vishuddha Chakra, and we all can get there through the heart. And when we sing, we sing in the Vishuddha Chakra, and we emanate light when we sing. And the spiritual quality is calmness and expansion. And so this is important. Yudhisthira gives us a weapon here. And also, he is a great warrior. He's the head of the Pandavas, the greatest warrior. And what weapon does he use? It's the calmness in our trials. Because so many of our tests and trials, when we want to overcome the tests of life, they might be, we need to have a spiritual, a psychological weapon. It doesn't help us to grow strong in our body, but the calmness is the deepest weapon, the most effective weapon to develop. 
And I want to give you an example of how important this weapon can be when we try to cultivate in our lives a certain spiritual discipline. There was once a businessman of great success, very rich, very good in his work. Also, he was a gentleman. He knew how to think about his business, but he was very, very stressed. And at a certain point, he goes to his doctor for this annual checkup and the doctor says if you continue to live like this in one year we can take you to the cemetery your blood pressure is so high your cholesterol is super high and so on so the man said ah, but what can I do I love my work I don't have time to rest and so the medical doctor has a great idea he says you are someone who always needs to do something to have a result why don't you try something more uh, recreative and he says okay I will do something that regenerates me so I the medical doctor says why don't you paint uh, and the man says, oh, that's a great idea, and immediately buys everything he needs. And after three days, he calls his doctor and says, look, doctor, it was a great help. In three days, I already drew 20 pictures. Sometimes we are so conditioned by the world that we have a similar approach to our spirituality than to our daily life. You look at the watch and say, how much did I meditate? How long? And the ego is happy when you have medit when we have meditated 45 minutes, and the ego feels guilty when you only when we only meditated 30 minutes, for example. Or, for example, I can also share this. I'm thinking I need a seclusion. And also here, a seclusion for us is that we withdraw for a few days or for a week and you don't see anyone, you turn off your computer, your mobile phone, you, you walk, you do spiritual practices, you write your spiritual diary, that's seclusion, you eat a little less, and so on. And so I'm thinking about a seclusion, and then I realize that I have become like a businessman. How many days of seclusion did I do? And I realize that for my service, I'm already quite alone at home. My a wife is more on the battlefield. She works at Terra di Luce in our farm, but I often work from home. So the only thing that I can do to value this seclusion, which I already naturally have in my daily life, is to take some hours to turn the phone off, the computer off, and maybe to work uh, writing by hand. And I love to do that, to take uh, I love uh, little booklets, uh, and to, uh, I always uh, buy uh, new uh, pens to write, and so I love to do to write something on ha by hand. And so I try to render my service a form of seclusion, and this was an important lesson for me, a more calm approach. Not the idea of saying, I need to do a seclusion, I need to meditate for one hour, not 45 minutes. I need to do 108 kriyas and not 72. I need to practice Hong Sa two hours a day, like the Master said, otherwise I will not find God this lifetime. I will not become a Master, and so on. The ego quantifies everything. and. What should be a love story between me and God, only between me and my guru or God, becomes a social story. I start comparing myself to others. 
Meditation can also be social because it's wonderful to meditate together. And in that sense, social spirituality is beautiful. But I mean, it's not good if I compare my spiritual practices, my sadhana, to those of others. And so, in a certain sense, calmness is even more important than meditation itself because if you meditate but your motivation remains attached to the ego then you don't have that calmness and you cannot go deep calmness is not indifference and this is interesting especially when in southern countries let's say where emotions are seen as something positive. In reality, also in the autobiography of a yogi, we find many sentences where the master shows great emotions of uh, mourning when his mother dies, of fear when Sri Yukteswa before the uh, his master Sri Yukteswar says, are you ready for your university exams? And Yogananda says, oh, no, it's three days before the exams. And Yogananda takes, gets a little panicked. And Sri Yukteswar remains calmness, calm and says, do your best. You still have three days for 10 exams. Just do your best. And like this also in other examples. But what we want to understand in a yogical way of calmness is and emotions is that when emotions become too much or chronic or habitual, then they take us out of our center. When we are in enthusiasm or joy or also in pain, then it might give some richness to life, but inwardly it is much more important to remain connected to the deepest sentiment of our heart. And that is not indifference, it's just calmness. And I want to tell you a story to end a story that was told to me by a medium and it has to do with one of my past incarnations not like Giulio Cesare I was not that I was a very happy and beautiful very spiritual person in one of my past lives this medium taught me so I trusted this person she entered meditation and she said, you were a violinist, and I think she talked about 1800, and you were the son of a very famous violinist. And this father, on one hand, taught you the art of playing violin, but when you grew up and had to make your own career, develop your own talent, your father got very jealous. And this was your father, so he had a big influence on the son. So this son develops inner blockages. His music cannot flow anymore because every time he takes the violin into his hand, he thinks about his father and thinks, I cannot compete with my dad. I would offend him. So this, he has this sentiment very deep inside. And so he still has a way, a life of a musician because that's what he knows how to do. And in the beginning, he has a little success, but then his success declines because even if the father at a certain point leaves his body, the uh, ghost of his father follows him. The son cannot get rid of that father's influence. And so he plays a little bit of music in big cities and then he starts having blockages and he starts drinking to, um, to get rid of the blockages, but then the alcohol makes him get even more declined in his career and then 
he starts playing in a circus. He, who was supposed to have a great career, and in the end, basta. He returns home. He goes home and he um, destroys his instrument, his violin. And in that moment, and this is what the medium said to me, she said, in that moment, you realized how much you loved that instrument, you, how much you loved that violin, always. And only in that dramatic moment when you destroyed it, you realized how much you loved it. And this is a little bit, it's very dramatic, but where the, the father and the son represent the ego, the violin represents the voice of the soul. This voice of the soul could not speak freely because it was blocked by the attachment of social ambition. He had to have a career. But if you are happy inside and then God gives you a violin or a piano or a beautiful voice to express this song of the soul, where are the blockages? They don't exist. This is to say how intimate the relationship with God should be. Take the relationship, keep it between you and God, between you and the Guru, you and Divine Mother, and let the voice of your soul speak to him. Let your soul sing in silence. And it, you should not matter if others listen to you or not. It's an intimate relation. And if you don't care anymore what others think, then God can work through you. It's like you have this little dog, Dharma, by your side, and he will not leave you. You will not have an empty heart. As a last thing, I want to share this message of hope with you. And while we listen to Anadi reading the uh, lecture of today and the uh, quotation of Krishna from the Bhagavad Gita, it says, like the embryo in the uterus is like this also ourself is imprisoned in our desires. And Swami explains that if the fire is hidden by dust, then a little meditation gets this dust uh, away and you can see the fire clearly. If the mirror is covered by impurity, then take a little cloth and clean it well and then you can see inside the mirror and you can see your true self. But the embryo, Swami says, the embryo in the uterus cannot do anything. And in many of us, in all of us, we can discover within us tamasic tendencies and especially try to avoid to judge yourself. Don't judge yourself ever. But ask yourself, is this something I can already get out now? And if, for example, you suffer from uh, stress attacks and you say, I meditate now for six years and still I'm having panic attacks uh, or depression or trauma or whatever, the reign of the heavens is not does not exclude you. The only thing you need to do in this case is have a little patience, Swami says, and let nature do her work. But that part of you that knows that it has patience, it has a trust that this embryo will grow inside of you and will be ready to get out of the prison of the uterus, this faith you can develop. Maybe you cannot all in once immediately get your trauma away, but you can develop this attitude of patience to wait and to work on your strengths. 
to choose your battles and you say, okay, I have understood this fear is very, very deep. Maybe don't try to overcome it. Try to concentrate on something else and leave this to nature, to patience. And since I choose Dharma as my own friend in life, and since I want to find God, I have faith that the embryo inside of me will become big and get out and I will be free. Thank you. Thank you.